Well, that's 600 pounds in the cabinet. I've got my little Accurate sensor here so I can monitor the temperature in the cabinet. I just have to check to make sure I got the pallets inside here and then I close it up. <clears throat> latch it, push the bottom in. Now, people always ask me what temperature they should use. And I'm not going to tell you what you should use. Uh, I worked out a system where I can set this at 47 degrees C and uh, leave it for a length of time. And that length of time is usually up to a week. Uh, and uh, the temp uh, and the honey's just fine. Don't forget there's 600 pounds of honey in there and there's just four light bulbs creating the heat. So it's really not that hot. Uh, it doesn't get hot fast. It'll take 12 hours to come up to temperature. So you didn't get to see that. You didn't get to see that controller that's a pan johnson controls a421 uh it's a pretty good controller it's far higher quality than a standard ink bird system but uh, regardless that's kind of how i do that it's tuesday january 23rd 2024 and uh so you could see i just loaded my cabinet with 600 pounds more honey and that's a challenge because I'm still not allowed to lift things. Uh, my wife, God bless her, she uh, went in there last evening while well, I went in there with her. And she carried those 12 pails kind of from the back where they were over toward the door. We put them on those two pallets so that I could grab them with the tractor. I'm sure glad I set that system up years ago with uh, with the tractor in the cabinet. Um, whereas I don't have to lift all the pails into the cabinet every time. You know, I did it as a, a work saving and a back saving exercise, but it sure saved me this time. Because I need to get more honey packed and there's no way I could carry those pails up there and, you know, follow doctor's orders. So, uh, it's next week before I see the doctor and uh, you know even though even though we're we're a couple days more than a month post-op uh, I haven't had the all clear word from the doctor so I'm gonna leave it at that and continue to try to get by for another week or so a little more than a week anyway so you can see what I've been doing here I've built just over a hundred medium frames and that's for comb honey production this summer um, and as i was describing earlier i've got some of these pieces of wood stuck into the groove and this is milled just right so that it goes in there nice and firm uh, looks like i could tap that down in there some more yeah and this is plenty you don't need any more than this to stick up out of there yeah, you can run some beeswax if you want um, I don't know that it's necessary. I may or may not do that. Some of the pieces that I uh, ripped up here uh, don't fit very tight. Um, so this is what I'm going for. These are these are five eighths of an inch wide, and uh, so that's what I'm going for. But these are not really that tight. So I'm just going to dribble some beeswax in there. I don't need to I don't need to secure it in there real tight because once they build that comb it's all stuck in there anyway. It's not going to not going to come out of there. So that's I need to do that still. And the challenge there is to find some material. I don't have uh, I don't have a lot of material right now for that. I just had some scrap pieces here and it has to be 16 and you know 16 and 7 8 ish uh, or a little less long so that's pretty long for off cuts the off cuts i produce are generally that long my table saw is very 
covered in crop that is too heavy for me to move. Uh, I just want to show you something about cutting thin strips like that. It's difficult to do. It's difficult to do safely. And this is why, you know, it, this, these strips need to be, need to be about this thick. And problem is you get that, that fence that close to the blade. And first of all, you have trouble pushing it through. This is a very thin push stick and I've made it even thinner because I've run it through and cut it with the blade. But, uh, you know, you have to do this. And plus, getting a, a tiny piece like that wedged in here is, is not the greatest. So ideally, you want to cut a piece down to a, a minimum width that you can handle with this push stick and get through there safely. So then that ends up being your off cut. You can't use that. And what you can do, so I'm using this feather board backwards and I'm using that as a guide. I can move my rip fence up to it and I've got that set so that uh, it's, it's set to produce my strip on this side of the blade. Okay, so then what happens is when I go through here, um, the workpiece clears the guide, and then when I cut it, what I'm pushing is the large piece, and the small piece then can fall away from the blade. So that's kind of the difficulties in, in uh, cutting thin strips like that and then, of course, every time I make a cut, then I need to move my rip fence and get it, you know, that's, that's mostly just a measuring block. It's not a, it's not a fence that really keeps things pushed in. Um, and I can't use a second one. I'd like to use this to keep the piece toward the fence, but I can't do that because and what that does is then it traps the thin strip between the blade and the feather board. And if nothing else, that's really not what you want. Sometimes it can come back at you, which is I a mean, small piece of wood. It's not that big a deal, but you want to work as safe as you can. So I need to find some material before I can cut those. Uh, so I'm not getting too concerned about this right now. So I may just finish off the last of my foundation. I have about, I don't know, 30 sheets of this right cell left. So I might as well just build those out uh, in deeps. Again, this is, you know, all these frames I'm building is a, a keep busy project. I don't really need them in any, any hurry at all uh, because uh, again, I have, I have 700 and well over 700 frames in the apiary that are, they're good frames. They're just the frames that I, I culled out last summer and the 700 sheets of foundation too. So that's uh, boy, that's a lot of expense out there. 700, there's uh, 14, there's well over $2,000 worth of frames and foundation there. And so it's going to be waiting until the weather is warmer until I can work outside with the pressure washer, etc., and wash all the foundation off real nice as best I can. Um, I want to get the melter going and put some water and some sodium carbonate in it uh, just to uh, wash up the frames real nice. That, boy, that does a nice job, that stuff. It, it almost seems, and I don't know if it does, but it almost seems like it, it dissolves propolis and wax. I washed my melter with it last fall uh, or late last summer before I was extracting and uh, that melter looked like it was brand new when I was done. I just put sodium carbonate in water and cooked it overnight, cooked it nice and warm. And then in the morning I drained it and rinsed it and just uh, gave it a quick 
little scrub. I'll, I'll say a scrub, but it wasn't a scrub. It's just do that once over with a, I had a, I call it a potato washer. It's a, it's got a handle and then on the end, it's a plastic bristle thing. Uh, so that's what I washed it with. So it wasn't um, uh, a difficult scour process at all. So that was really nice that it came clean. And I'm planning to do that with the frames. Uh, the foundation, I'm not really sure. Most of it came out pretty good. Some of it got a bit warped in the melter when I was rendering. Uh, so I'll have to work on that stuff a little bit. I want to wash it all up really good with a pressure washer and kind of sort them as I go at that time. And uh, I'm thinking that if, if some of it is warped a bit, uh, none of it's really bad, but you know, it, it can't have, um, if it's, if it's in the, if it's, if it's warped this way, that's one thing, but it doesn't warp that way because you put that in the frame and the frame holds it, but it, it always, it always will warp this way, you know, when it gets hot. So what I'm thinking is if, if there's, if there's too many of them, they're warped to just throw them out. And I don't want to throw them out. That's a buck 85, uh, is to set them in there, set them in the bottom of the melter and uh, just stack them up in, in a nice even stack. Maybe put a couple of bricks on top for weight and just run it up, you know, kind of warm and kind of warm. I think if I ran it up about 75 degrees C, I think that would be just right because I know that that's about the temperature where it starts to warp. So if I ran it up about 75 degrees C, got them, you know, malleable a little bit, then turn it off and let it cool. Maybe I'd have hope that they'll stay flat at that point. So that's a long explanation for that. Because uh, you want to save money, right? You don't, you don't want to lose that foundation. That's expensive stuff. Uh, Weather-wise, it got warm today. Uh, minus nine, I think, minus seven. I was out today on the tractor. I got to clear some snow which is great because I was getting behind on that with, you know, with the surgery thing and with the cold weather. I don't like working out there in the cold weather. Want to make sure the driveway's clear in case, you know, house catches on fire or I have a heart attack or something, you know, got to get emergency services in here. Um, but that's really nice that it was warmer and tomorrow was going to be even warmer. I think minus one is the forecast high here for tomorrow, which is great. Uh, it's nice when it stays below freezing because when it starts to go above freezing, then things get really awful and messy and disgusting out there. Uh, a few degrees below freezing is nice. You can work outside without too much trouble and things stay frozen. They stay crisp. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. It won't be too long before all the snow will melt and we get back to it. It's Thursday, January 25th. 2024. Of course, you can see I'm in the bee barn, just checking things out. You know, there's not a lot I can do in here and there's not a lot I can see that would make any difference to me. But, you know, <laughs> your curiosity just can't keep you, uh, keep you out of here sometimes. And you can maybe hear the exhaust fan running in the background. That's kind of a good sign because we have some warmer weather right now. The temperature outside I think is about minus three C. So it's very warm. It's, you know, still below freezing, but uh, the equilibrium for this building with about 100, 150 colonies in it is about minus 10 C. Meaning when the temperature is above minus 10, then the ventilation fan needs to cool the building. When the temperature is below about minus 10, then the uh, the heater actually runs to keep the building up to temperature. So above minus 10, the, the bees heat the building. When it's below minus 10, uh, the CO2 stat will kick in to ventilate the building. And honestly, in what I've learned over the last, I guess, eight or so years, is that CO2 stat is really there for my 
comfort and protection. Um, the bees tolerate very high CO2 levels. It seems that they scare about CO2 layering, etc. Might not have as much to it as we're led to believe. This year I didn't even put my box fans out, so we'll see. If all my bees on the floor are dead, then I guess that means I should have put my box fans out. However, uh, I just thought today might be a good day to lift some lids and see if there's anything going on in there. I brought my protection, <laughs> just in case things get wild. Uh, but I'll climb up on the ladder and we'll lift a few lids. Of course, these are four high, right? One, two, three, four. And these are actually these are actually five up there because they're they're just little nukes that aren't on a pallet. So let's have a look in a few of these. You can't see very well, but there's there's bees there. There's bees hanging from the lid. And the light is not over here. Um, and, and that pleases me because these little four framers I've got here, they were made up as, uh, they were larger colonies that just shrunk down in the fall. So I put them in smaller boxes. sure there's anything alive there or not oh yeah a little cluster in the corner not very much though so I can't reach very far now this is a six frame that's a 2023 queen that I raised not survive well rest in peace I don't think I can reach that one but in these bricks here there was something in the building I don't know if you can see this one over here that feed plug has been pulled out there was something in here pulling feed plugs out so I put bricks on a few That one has no foamy. I should move that foamy over. It doesn't look good though. But it's alive. I'm going to move that foamy over. It's not focusing very well. That's also a home raised 23 queen. And that one also is deceased. was okay this one I remember I've got small this was around seven grafting 23 and that queen was really small and so I marked that I'm sure she was not a good queen but I just marked that because I wanted to watch that for my own education and it did not make it this is 
I don't think that made it either. So we're not, not doing too good so far. I can hear them there. Quite reach it so I can't really get in there. Look at this one. And so that that was a colony. That was a colony that got an Appy tablet shortly before it went into the building. And so was this one here. And I hear the mumming in there. Pretty good. Let's check. Yeah, that's a box of bees. Nice, that's encouraging since they had a lot of mortality here. So, those two are the Appy tablets, those were the Alberta bees. And so Alberta bees plus Appy tablets. These two are Alberta bees, no Appy tablets. And I can hear them in there. That one isn't as big. But they're vigorous. Got a better light. And this is Alberta bees with no Appy tablet. So again, they still look pretty good. They just are not quite as big as the other two. It's nice to think that the happy tablets have made a positive difference, but that's a very small sample size. This Sure, there's anybody home there, and that's again a, another four framer. I didn't really expect these to survive, they were they were kind of duds, but I just couldn't bring myself to pull the plug. I've been trying to catch whatever was taking the plugs out, so I put glue traps and. Nobody. There's nobody in my glue traps. Okay, so this is a grafted 22 queen. Uh, can't quite read this. This was a, looks like a swarm 23. And this is an old 2020 queen that I got from a friend. Those queens that he made were pretty nice. Okay, let's see about the old 22. I don't hear anything. That's because they're all dead. Yeah. 
All looking good. There might be a bad spring here. Okay, let's try this one. I really expect this old 2020 queen to make it again. She has decided to call it quits. dead too. Sure a lot of mortality here. So I don't know what's in the nukes over there. I can't reach them. Or can I? A little cluster in the back there. get to worry about that for the next let's see uh, February March two months anyway before these bees come out uh, they may not come out until I'm expecting them to come out early this year perhaps early March but it some years it's early April what are you gonna do you can't make live bees out of dead ones as simple as that you got to make live bees out of live ones. Oh well. Guess I'll go back to woodshop make some frames for dead bees. It's Friday, January 26, 2024. Still quiet around here. Uh, I'm actually getting very frustrated with the lack of things that I can actually do. And even the things I can do, I'm not motivated to because everything seems to just and in a roadblock, either something's too low to lift or something's too heavy to lift. So I'm just kind of puttering, doing what I can. And one of the things I can do is, uh, you've seen me making my comb honey mediums. I've got some here. Um, well, yesterday, I'll start with this. Yesterday, I built uh, the last, uh, what was it, 25? 25 deeps that I had foundation for so I've used up all the foundation I have now so I'll stop there for now I could build frames without foundation uh, to snap that in later um, that's that's a good thing to do because it doesn't take long to snap in foundation however the frames uh, before assembly are far easier to store and you know once I get them in this form they get a little bit harder to store I uh, have, you know, I want to keep them cleaner. I want to keep them, you know, away from the mice and things and uh, certainly in out of the weather. Uh, so anyway, I built my uh, foundationless mediums for comb honey and I've put these together. I put strips in them already and you saw that I was making some strips, but my conundrum was I didn't have a lot of raw material on hand particularly off cuts that are long enough you know I've got I've got some off cuts and things here but a lot of them aren't long enough I I have cut a lot of them up already however I found some stuff in the corner and I think it's going to work out this is a this is a sort of a frame thing that comes when I buy my jars I buy my jars by the skid and this frame uh, sits on top of the skid so that you can strap uh, the load without crushing the boxes so I saved that and I, I this is the second one I've saved uh, so I had some of this material sitting around here in the corner and I thought hey I wonder if that's thick enough it's barely thick enough it's about nine sixteenths I was going for five eighths but nine sixteenths does uh, protrude far enough out of that that top bar to work for comb honey so look at this I've got a lot more 
raw material here I can use for my comb honey top bar strips. Uh, the pieces I did find in the corner, I, I cut the length and then ripped on the table saw. So I've got quite a few here now. And I can put those in the frames. I've done these frames. Now I've put the strips in here in the tops, bundled it up into 10 just to make it easier to handle. So that's what I'm going to be doing here. I'm going to cut this into pieces to length and then I'm going to start to rip it on the table saw to, uh, to my dialed in width and the width I have set up on there seems to be just right because it does take a bit of a tappy tap with the hammer to get that strip to go in that groove which is ideal because then it's in there I don't have to secure it with anything. Okay, so the first uh, first order of business is to cut this to length. Now I've got a half lap joint here with some staples in it, so I don't I don't want to cut through that, and I, I want to make sure I cut that off, so I'm not using that part. So we'll get to that. This one's all warped, I'm not sure if I can even use it. Have to make sure I catch that so it doesn't fall on the floor. If it's on the floor, it's on the floor for good. Okay, so now I want to I'm gonna measure this out to see how this compares, see how thrifty I need to be. I can't get three out of that anyway, so I can just slice that anywhere. So now I can cut these to length. And that's my little length stick. This is not a precision cut, just can't be too long. a regular hockey stick. It's kind of dangerous working with material that's warped and twisted and whatnot. To make sure it sits against the fence here. This this is not important, but make sure it sits in there nice. I'll have to try to straighten that on the table saw, which again is tricky. Okay, let's see if we can deal with this to start with. It's not something I recommend you do if you're not experienced on the table saw. I'm going to raise my blade a little bit. 
typically, unless I'm doing something specialty that would require otherwise, I like to have the gullet of the blade just outside the wood. Uh, I don't really know why. Uh, it helps, I think it helps to keep the, the teeth cooler, to have them exit the blade, exit the wood here before they go back in. And I also think it helps with the uh, chip extraction. But what I think it helps with mostly is it gives you a guide. I've seen people run their blade right down close to the top, even closer than that. And if, if you have a situation where your workpiece rides up, it doesn't have to ride up far before it hits the top of your blade. And if, if that hits the top of the blade like that, that piece of wood will go right through the wall of your shop. And I don't have to tell you that that's not what you want to happen. And if it hits you, you'll be going to hospital, likely. Okay, so this is the part I don't recommend, but this is a slow uh, process, multiple passes here, um, because I'm gonna run the cup toward the fence, and I'm just gonna start to shave this off until I get it straight. Once I get it straight, I can turn around, and then I can take off these pieces here. Okay, so let's see. I saw a uh, video this morning by Tom Bacon, and uh, every word he said was true. He talked about safety glasses, dust collection, dust protection, hearing protection. Uh, he's absolutely correct on all of that. I see that he has a saw stop PCS in his shop too. Being safety minded, you know, he would. I, I wondered when that video started and he started being emphatic about safety, I thought, I wonder if he has a saw stop. Um, it's not that you have to have a saw stop to be safe. You can be, you can work safe with a conventional table saw, um, but it's that uh, extra margin of safety having this blade break technology um, in your shop. And I'll, I'll expand on that a little, just in case there's viewers that don't understand that. The saw stop table saw has a break inside here that if I were to run a piece of wood and touch that blade, before that blade makes even a third degree cut in my finger, that blade will stop and disappear below the table surface. And I've had it happen. I haven't touched it. It will be set off in such uh, times as I, I, I cut through a glue line, a wet glue line one time, so it set it off and different situations. So anyway, it's a little bit of a pain because of that. You have to be careful what you cut through, but uh, it also gives you some peace of mind that it's not going to cut your fingers off. You can, because sometimes you have to bypass it if you're cutting something that's likely to set off the brake. So you can bypass that and then that defeats the safety and you can cut your fingers off. So anyway, that's just the saw stop. I was glad to see uh, Tom do that video. So let's start the dust collector and we'll make some cuts.
Okay, so now those are straight and I can proceed now to cut. I, did, I didn't want to move this because I've got it set up just right. Uh, otherwise I could have done that in probably a couple of passes. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll now just zip those up into pieces, thin strips. See how as I cut this, it becomes, uh, it starts to twist again. Okay. I think I can still get one more though. That piece is a little bit warped the other way, so it's chattering on the table like that. Okay, I have six pieces here to cut, but I want to size them all initially. I want to make them straight and a consistent size, because I want to run all six through and then adjust my fence and then run all six through again. start with the, the straight, clean side against the fence and size it from there. Okay, hopefully they're the right width to go in that groove. I can feel that's plenty wide, so I'll give it a tap. Hopefully it goes down in there. Yep. Just like that. So sometimes they crack, sometimes I get it in there farther than others. I don't want to stick out too far because that's just comb honey that you can't cut. Hammer's too big to get in there, so <laughs> I'm gonna put the hammer sideways. 
and it seems like I'm hitting it pretty hard, and I kind of am, but this is a very small hammer, so it doesn't carry that mo momentum on it. I like this little tack hammer. I never had one like this before, but for stuff like frames and whatnot, fixing things, small jobs, it's very nice. You don't beat the crap out of things with it as easily. You can. Sometimes better than others, eh? Well, at least I have a little job to do today. And uh, look forward to next week when doctor says I can really go full steam ahead in here. Then I'll be complaining that I'm sore and I'm tired and <laughs> all that stuff. But that's okay. It'll help fix my head, you know. It's been stressful to see the days waning on. And I think it's not good for a person to kind of not have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. You know, there, there are a lot of people in the world who are in that position for whatever reason. Some of them very valid reasons, like now, right? It's a valid reason. But for uh, the, the, the effects of that kind of thing are not good for a person. You need, you need a drive. You need something whipping you. And, and, uh, and you need an enterprise so that at the end of the day, you can take a look around and you can see, okay, I accomplished this today. Um, I, I think it's consistent among the population. Now, I, I may be just one person and that may be what I feel, but I certainly feel it coming from a farming background and, and you know, always being taught that an honest day's work is good for a person. Uh, that's just what I feel. I, I, I can take a lot of time off, but it becomes too much for me even. Anyway, that's my little theory on the world. And I'm just going to bang some of these shims into place. And that's, that's about it. Uh, I've been doing a lot of computer work. I'll get back on a computer and do something worthwhile. And, you know, I, I really appreciate you watching. I really do. Um, thanks for sticking with me through this time. And not having very much content for you. And it'll be another probably two weeks before I have too much more to show you. Uh, I've got two lifts of plywood out there to cut up, so hopefully that'll be entertaining here pretty soon. I really appreciate you watching in the meantime, and stick around for all the fun. We've got lots of pallets and covers to build, and uh, we'll get into that soon enough. Okay, so you have a, a great weekend. Take care of yourself, and uh, and hopefully your bees are doing good. You know, we saw yesterday my bees are maybe not doing so good. We'll see in the spring what we have to deal with, right? And then we'll make a new plan. And have a great day. Take care and have fun.